Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to uh, give a special thanks to our special guest tonight, Melissa Palmer. Uh, Melissa is a special agent um, and has been uh, helping the um, sub two and the Gator community um, with vetting deals. She's an awesome. She has a background in uh, all kinds of cool stuff, <laughs> but uh, she's been a, a rock star lately, helping people uh, not lose money. Like that's that's a big topic right now, and um, we're just happy to have you on here. Thank you, Mel, for for hopping on. How are you doing tonight? Hey, thanks, Lance. I'm doing really well. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to start off with just kind of getting to know you a little bit. Where where are you from, and uh, what? What did you do before real estate? Sure. Um, so I'm from Wisconsin, <laughs> but I live in Monterey, California. And uh, before real estate and currently, I was um, active duty Air Force for 12 years. So um, while I was in the Air Force, I was a federal agent, Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Um, and I conducted um, all of our federal level criminal investigations um, and counterintelligence because where the DOD and we had a pretty small agency that had a pretty wide scope of investigations. So I spent uh, about two years looking at fraud and sexual assault cases, um, two years going to uh, the, I actually came out to Monterey, California to go to um, Chinese uh, training. So I, I uh, went through the language school for Mandarin um, and then I did export enforcement um, and oversaw all of our cases and operations in the Pacific. Um, so I would go to Hong Kong and do joint investigations with Commerce and Department of Commerce and Homeland Security. Um, and then while I was in Hawaii, um, making huge sacrifices for our country in Hawaii, um, <laughs> I uh, was doing our our oversight for all of our cases and operations. And um, for one year, I was doing all of the criminal, um, like our criminal side and the other, other years I was doing our counterintelligence side. So. Wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> that's a, that's on heck of a background. Thank you so much for everything you're doing for the community too, by the way, uh, you are just helping out a lot of people. And I, I know we all appreciate what you're doing. <clears throat> Do you want to, you want to go into what got you kind of into what you're doing now? How, why, why did you decide to uh, start being, you know, the go-to for vetting, uh, vetting deals and vetting borrowers? Sure. Why did I make up a job? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd love to hear yeah. this story. So, um, yeah, let's see. So I started investing when I was in the Air Force. The beautiful part about your VA benefits is a lot of military members learn early that you can get into properties and you can invest. And I will say I bought my first house in 2009, um, but I was certainly not an investor at the time. I had total Dave Ramsey mindset. I was like, um, you know, just just stockpiling my cash. And I bought a house in 2009 in Vegas, while the market just crashed. And so it was so risky. And I will say over time, when you look at real estate, no matter when it was, you'll hear people say real estate is risky. And the through line is that it's always got something, the market's so crazy. There's always something going on. Um, I bought my house for $120,000 in Vegas. And it was like a nine-year-old home um, and at the bottom of the market. But I will also say to us, it felt insane because it was listed for $70,000. And so it was like, oh, the only way could, I think I got outbid on like 10 different houses before I got it. And so I would say no matter the time or the place or the prices or the market, it's always kind of crazy. And there's always something to adjust to. Um, but so bought my first house, not an investor, but getting reps in over time. Right. And so, um, 2016 is when I would say I had an investor's mindset where I bought a property in Hawaii specifically with the intent to, um, house hack it. And so there was an 800 square foot space of nothing. And I converted that mm -hmm. to, um, a kitchenette and a bathroom. And in my head, that was going to be my quarters. And I was going to rent out the three bedroom, two bath upstairs, and then expectations versus reality on my first investment, 
I got ripped off by a contractor. Uh, my permits never came through. I uh, had a a uh, problem with the developer because it was a brand new build and my flooring was coming up. And then I found out that there was a foundation issue mm. and blah, blah, blah. I won in mediation. We skipped arbitration. I got a check. I got them to fix everything. But I will tell you, it was two and a half year battle and mm. lots of hard lessons learned. And just some of the like early hiccups that everybody goes through when you start get started in real estate. And so mm -hmm. Came to sub two 2019 and I started TCing because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty uh, anal. <laughs> and I, I like to look at everything. I like to know how to do it. I'm, uh, you know, yeah. I told you, I'm, so you're like, an OG. Wow. Like <laughs> what, how many people were in sub two when you, when you joined? I have to, I have to just ask. That's a good question. I want to say it was like 2,600 people. Okay. And at the time, you say I'm an OG, but at the time, oh my goodness, that's 2,600 <laughs> people before me are like, <laughs> you know, right? And so <laughs> now, now I'm technically one, right? But no, um, it's yeah. So 2019 or 20. Sorry, did I say 2019? That's yeah. not true. Yeah, that's not true at all. Sorry. <laughs> um, 2019 is when I got out of the Air Force. Um, okay. 20 January 20. Uh, almost two years where are we at um it's still og status January is two years but yeah nice. there were 2600 okay. or so got it um sorry yeah wisconsin what up are you from wisconsin thomas <laughs> so yeah that's the that's the journey i i joined and i started tcing um but the i guess i kind of gave you a very long you, you told me that i that was okay but um so let's yeah. see how did I get started with what I'm doing in my made up job, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. What led you to being the go-to for vetting and getting, you know, having paste kind of boost you up, uh, you know, on a, uh, put you on a platform? Yeah. So um, I started TCing last October mm -hmm. um, and I realized there were so many like crappy deals being done <laughs> because I would see this where for a while people were just bringing me really horrible deals and I was like hey I don't think you should do this but I have no you know I don't want to rain on your parade and you know if you if you want us to go through with this we'll open escrow and um after a while it got to the point where I was just like people aren't like listening and it's not my it's not my deal. <laughs> so I, they're hiring me to do a certain job, but I just felt increasingly uncomfortable, especially when I was seeing these underwater sub twos taking on um, PMLs for their entry fees, because it's like, what's your exit here? You're not flipping it. It's already underwater. And um, you didn't even have the money for an entry fee. So how are you going to have money to pay them back? <laughs> so mm. that was tough because people always blame the TC. And I'm like, it's not my deal. It's not my agreement. I told you guys this was a little squirrely and you guys want to, you know, treat me like the help, even though I've seen way more deals than you. Because <laughs> <laughs> often these are people's like first and second deals. and so. They come back six months later, balloons do. Well, what about this? What about that? Well, first of all, I'm only open to close. Escrow is my period. Uh, so anything outside of that is not a TC. Mm -hmm. Second of all, um, like what, what's the goal here? Do you want a quick claim? Do you want, so I'd help people with loan modifications. I'd help them with quick claiming. I'd help them. And so it got to the point where I was like, this is so out of scope. Mm -hmm. People are making me do triple the work and making me is not fair because I could have just said no, but I'm a bleeding heart. And I was just like, yeah, sure. I'll help. And um, it got to the point where I just tell people no, when I'd see these crappy deals. Yeah. And then I was like, or I can come in as a consultant and help people with due diligence so that we're not dealing with all the painkillers, all the aftermath deals gone south, and we can help be diligent on the front end. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. let's take our vitamins. Let's be mm -hmm. diligent. Let's be researched. <laughs> I love that. 
like <laughs> take our vitamins. That's so smart. I, it's funny. Like it just reminds me. We take vitamins every day, morning and in the evening. And my wife always gives me this this crappy look. I'm like, I hand her her vitamin pack, and she's just like, fine. Yeah, you know? I'm like, dude, vitamins. I'm doing half the work for you, or reminding you. <laughs> it's yeah. so funny. Yeah, and Love it's that. like, it's you know, a little Band-Aid wrap. It's not like comfortable. You don't love paying the fee. You think you get into creative finance because everything's no cash, no credit. And you're like, yeah, it can be. <laughs> yeah, super important. But, and I've heard that a lot though. People think that TCs are going to underwrite basically and do every all these things. And I'm like, that's not what a transaction coordinator does. They basically help you get the seal the deal right what what is the job of a transaction coordinator yeah so they're communicating with title and escrow they are making sure that your title and escrow instructions are executed so and here's something that i ran into all the time and i'd help with but um you know people always want you then i ended up closing deals for people all the time because they do a seller walkthrough well when i have to hunt them down over the course of two weeks and spend an hour objection handling getting to get them to sign a contract. That sounds like closing, mm. <laughs> not like a seller walkthrough. Um, and so it, 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 there's all sorts of things that people kind of normalize making TCs do. And I think a lot of TCs need to stand their ground and understand their worth and the scope of work and where, where they come in. But really without a, without a contract, there is no transaction for a TC. You, so once you have a contract, until close of escrow is where a TC comes in and they help you with that entire process. So making sure that you're getting your uh, title report, your uh, title insurance, your um, any inspection periods, helping you remind you that that's about to close. And so if you haven't done your inspection yet, you're about to lose your EMD if you don't wanna go through with this. So they just kind of help that entire timeline. Um, and then if there are private lenders, um, if the escrow instructions say, and this is where I would come in all the time and be like, did you offer a deed in lieu of foreclosure? Because your, your contract does not say that. Did you offer to take over their solar loan? Because we just did a title report search and there's a solar loan on here. So are you taking that over as well? And so all sorts of things that TCs can help you with and make sure you have in your contracts um, throughout the, the process. But um, right. yeah, so not underwriting. <laughs> I love that. Not, not underwriting, not deal. vetting deals either. They they're not uh they're hired they're not hired to vet deals either, right? And No, they're I'm not. I'm glad you're talking about this cuz a lot of people don't really know what TCs do and they think that they just hand the deal to you and you do everything, you know, as right. a TC. <laughs> yeah, and especially when people they're like, "Well, I don't know what to do." And I was like, "We all have access to the exact same material." And so <laughs> that's like that's on you. If you're not a professional in your profession, um, this is this is the scope of work of somebody else. And this is you don't ask title and escrow how to do their job. And uh, so I always tell people uh, when you've got your extra abusers, I hope um, that's not anybody in here. But um, when <laughs> there are people who uh, have their TC do all sorts of things, I like to equate it to like going to the mechanic and asking for your oil change. You go, you ask for your oil change, you pay for an oil change. You don't go. And then ask them, how do you change your oil? And then, <laughs> could you tell me about my car? And by the way, could you teach me how to drive? Because I've never done this before. And you're like, that's a you problem, not a me problem. <laughs> like, that's so good. That is a so, great analogy. I love that. Just, just get your oil changed and leave the mechanic alone. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, but they they do a lot more communication and coordination as well so um. yeah absolutely so um i don't want to get too uh let's circle back actually i've been learning to circle back around so uh let's talk about what brought you to the to to the spot to, that you're in now like how did you get in the position from doing tc work to doing this whole new kind of business that came out of you know some bad uh dealings that you're doing now in vetting you know, what did yeah. that, what happened there? Can you tell us the story? Yeah. So I transitioned to consulting. So I was doing a lot of consulting. I was helping people with underwriting. I was helping with them with closing. I was helping them with all of the out of scope things that I was doing anyway, because I realized people needed that. And then 
I was seeing these things that I was like, all right, make it make sense. So for me, I was like kind of tripping out where I was like, you credit and background check a tenant to live in your property for $100 of cash flow a month. Why wouldn't you do that for somebody you're going to give $80,000 to? Mm. And um, when you see like the same people coming back, these were clients I fired because I just, I saw them keep coming back and having to quit claim properties and having to do loan modifications. And for me, it just like, didn't feel good. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't like ethical. This isn't, I, I don't, every time I would get an email from this person, I was just like, I don't, I don't want to take it. I don't want to help you. I don't like, <laughs> yeah, you can't pay me enough money to like be involved with your transactions. And so um, I was doing all this consulting and I was thinking back to my experience set, which in my head, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm no longer an agent. I'm no longer a badged and credentialed cop. And um, so I don't, I'm separating myself. I'm now an investor and I'm now this. And uh, really I was like, hmm, but all those skills really can help people. And so I went and started the process of getting my commercial license to be able to pull records, the things that I used to be able to access while I was a cop. And so because I know all these dat databases exist and because I know the process. And so I basically created um, like a background inquiry for and, and, you know, also because I understand how to underwrite, I understand um, creative deal structures. I was like, okay, so let's look at vetting the deal, verifying this person's background, education, and experience, and then actually having the data to prove it, like credit checks, like background checks. And so um, I started the process in February to be able to get my commercial license to pull this stuff. Um, and I was given this license in, I actually gave up. I was like, it's never going to happen. I had inspections. I had like maybe like six rounds of interviews. And I mean, obviously they're giving you a ton of information, but in my head, I was like, I had this like for years. And I was like, it's crazy to me. But now realizing, I mean, all of the personal information that I have access to is like, obviously they need to do their due diligence on, on me. But in my head, I was like, I guess this isn't going to happen. I'm too rinky dink of an operation and I need to have like an office space and five employees for them to trust me in my process. And um, one day I just got an email that was like, here's your username and login and here's your bill. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess it worked. Um, so February until June is that process for me to get my commercial license. Um, and then, um, and that's just to pull the records, that's to do um, the background checks. And so uh, I can look at liens, judgments, bankruptcies. And anyway, it, like it was kind of just me seeing this opportunity and obstacle and personally getting ripped off as well, kind of skipped that part. But, um, and, and you see that like these people would never pass any of the baseline checks mm -hmm. and they're able to get away with just ripping off people because we operate in this community of trust of well, we see people take an action and that means that they are experienced. But then I saw the behind the scenes as a TC. I also experienced the behind the scenes as somebody who got ripped off when I lended. And for me, I was like, I can do something about this. Like I have the skills, I have the resources. And so um, once I got my commercial license to do it, then um, it happened to like coincide with community camp. And, um, if you, cause you were there, Lance, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you remember, Vina was pacing back and forth on stage, talking about how much time she spends doing due diligence. Mm -hmm. I just launched my due diligence service and I was like, <laughs> I can help her out. <laughs> like, so I talked to Pace asked me to put somebody in contact with somebody else. He's like, Hey Mel, can you, you know, do this? And I was like, yeah. Can you put me in contact with Vina? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he was like wait nice. coming there <laughs> right on that's awesome yeah. so i love I that did it on my own and then he was like wait what the hell are you doing i love this <laughs> yeah that's a lot yeah i mean what you're doing is providing such a tremendous value um you know and and i, I like how you shared uh, a little bit about how you started in this by getting you know uh scammed yourself or ripped off um and that's basically 
we that we we went through the same thing you know we we got ripped off by a scam artist um who was uh really really smooth criminal and who like steals from old ladies basically that type of piece of crap um but yeah that's the same thing we that's why we started vetting heavily too so it makes a ton of sense and that you've been doing this obviously you have way more experience and you can dig a lot deeper than uh most of us know how to do and so um do you want to talk a little bit about your process about the vetting process how that what that looks like sure yeah so i always tell people don't invest in the deal deals don't default people do but you also can't invest in the person right because people drip honey when they want your money that's when mm -hmm. they show their best face right and um, it's not until their back's against the wall and all of a sudden you find out what kind of person they are. So um, you have to invest in that information. And starting with the deal, we're looking at the loan to value ratio. People think it doesn't matter because it's creative finance and it's no rules play like a champion. Well, it most certainly matters if you're the lender. <laughs> so might not matter to the borrower and it might not matter uh, you know, for cash flow purposes, but as a lender, you are not secure without a proper LTV. And that LTV needs to be based on your risk tolerance. But so I look at the loan to value ratio. I look at the security instruments. I look at the deal as it's presented and then um, sniff test the underwriting, but the underwriting is like, you should have that done prior to agreeing to something. Um, and then when we look at the person, we look at their background, education, and experience. And I like to stress relevant experience because experience is important. Uh, one, if there is no relevant experience, no problem. Now we're going to look at your background and what kind of experience you do have. Because if that experience is an inconsistent track record of anything, it makes me question whether or not you're able to, you know, perhaps dedicate yourself to any exit strategy or any, you know, discipline. Um, so just understanding background, education, experience, and the relevant experience. A wholesaler doesn't necessarily know how to hold an asset. Somebody who does long-term rentals doesn't necessarily know how to do a short-term rental. So you need to understand whether or not that experience translates to the exit strategy that they're presenting. And then um, the third piece that I talk about is the information. So that's where I'm actually doing the background and records checks. Um, that's where we're looking at credit. People get a little spicy about credit because they're like, well, no cash, no credit. That's why I'm here. What, what's my credit got to do with this? And I have bad credit. Well, okay, no problem. Why do you have bad credit? Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between like, I have bad credit because I have a whole bunch of new lines of credit because I'm a gator and I'm trying to build my credit. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's different than a delinquent record. That's different than somebody who doesn't pay their bills. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, or like Dave Ramsey, you know, Dave Ramsey mindset, I didn't believe in credit cards until two years ago. So I have no established credit history. Okay. That's different. So that credit isn't a problem. Um, a criminal record isn't a problem. A bankruptcy is not a problem. Why? What are the circumstances? What happened? If you had a, a $450,000, uh, medical bill because you had a heart attack, I don't think that bankruptcy is relevant. <laughs> but if you had a bankruptcy because you decided to walk away from six properties, mm. probably relevant. Yeah. So makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Does make a lot of sense. Wow. So how much like um is each deal like each deal is probably different, but on average, how long does it take you to vet a deal? Two weeks. Um, so I say two weeks and it can be done faster. And if it can be done faster, I will do it faster, but two weeks, because I don't know what's going to come up. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had um, investigations where everything was great until um, all these liens uh, were found. There was like $150,000 of liens and another $50,000 of uh, so state liens and federal liens. So I go back and I ask for a statement of explanation. And then I ask for, um, records. And in this case, I was like pretty badass. I thought, because it was like, Hey, I was in this partnership. All my partners left me holding the stick. We sold the property and, um, I got stuck with the taxes and here's my receipts. Here's the two, you know, these liens are gone. This one's going to be gone in four months. And here's all the records. It was like killer. I've had other ones where the entire time, the person like 
wasn't quite uncooperative, but was not cooperative. And their references were also very agitated and weird. Everything was inconsistent. Everything did not check out. Go back, ask for a statement of explanation. They drag their feet. They whatever. So I can't. I can't control the the length, but I can tell you, I, I can do it in two weeks. Um, two weeks or less. And sure. when you're talking, you know, a, a significant amount of money, I think time is important because mm. things reveal themselves over time. Somebody can get you everything you ask for in two days. Um, if you're only asking for this much information, but if we take a whole process where I talk to the lender, I talk to the borrower, I talk to the references, I look at the records, I go back and I ask more questions, you're going to get a lot more information and you're going to get a lot more comprehensive recommendations from me. If mm. I don't have that kind of time, mm -hmm. you'll get what you get. Right. Mm. And I just, to me, I'm like two weeks. That's, that's for you and for me. Hey, awesome. hey, Lance. Sorry, man. I was on a phone call trying to help a little old lady um, find find an apartment. I'm an agent and she's uh, she's distraught. She's getting kicked out of her apartment. So I'm trying to help her. So anyway, sorry, I was running late to the show. But yeah, so one of the things that I find really interesting, right? And I and I, I kind of always state this is that you always see a lot of the folks come across saying I need lending now. I've got to get lending on this thing now. And I always tell them, well, that's the first red flag is that you don't have your stuff together and you're asking me to get a private money loan together for you in the next 72 hours. Yeah. Right. That That's not going to happen. So, so yeah, I, I would, I would ask in, in lieu of that, right. Because we see a lot of these people kind of come across the community like this. What would you put out to those folks? Because, Hey, you, Hey, you need a private money lender. Should you have something laid out for me, some information laid out for me? So you present it to me, it's going to take me two weeks, but you need to be prepared. What would you like to see um, when they bring that stuff across? Yeah. So the lender themselves, or it, it depends on who initiates it, but it's most likely the lender. Um, and so I just say, give me their name, give me the um, deal information that you have. Um, I have the borrower redo the deal information, and um, I had a couple people like comment that that was redundant, and I was like, it's not, because it's very, very important if you tell me something different than they told me, because that tells me you don't know the kind of deal you're getting into, and you guys are already miscommunicating. So again, it's a service to you if I make you guys repeat things and be redundant, because... Um, more often than not, there's inconsistencies, even from the very beginning. Um, so to answer your specific question, what what do people need to give to me? Um, so I, I do ask for the deal information itself. And then I ask the borrower for all of their background information, um, background education experience, relevant experience for real estate. If they claim they've got a whole bunch of assets, they need to prove that. If I can't find them, often I can't because they've got them in um, LLCs. So um, I can search. And if I can see that it's in the LLC, then I need their operating agreements. It's a whole bunch of substantiating information, essentially. And so that's why it's the two week process. There's quite a bit of information. And the answer of what they need to provide is it depends, because if there's somebody that has no assets, they don't have to provide a whole lot of stuff. Um, but if they do have assets that they're claiming experience, the relevant experience on, then I'll, I need that information to actually confirm. Um, if they got a whole ton of stuff, and most of it's not relevant or they only want to know a couple then like well, let's not do the whole whole shebang because that's ridiculous i'm going through pace's stuff right now and he's got 1800 doors it's really mm -hmm. painful <laughs> so, 18 plus um 18 and counting so it's a very long process for that and we don't need to do that um it's a two-week process so you got six properties like just give me some addresses and some operating agreements and let's go um <laughs> but yeah so it just depends on what I need based on the deal itself. Yeah, un understandable. Yes, because as he was saying, you know, me and Justin and Lance have an interesting story where, and, and, and I'm not trying to cut you off, but I'd love for you to hear this and see what you would have done differently because I always love to tell people about where I failed and how I fail forward, right? Because we loaned a guy, uh, I guess we could put his name out there now, Herb, Herb Trotter. We would, we would like to make sure that nobody in the community does any kind of deals with Herb Trotter. Be very, very careful. 
he was doing a Morby method deal. And what he did is he needed, he needed the, um, he, he basically needed a bridge loan on it. So $57,000, we, we brought that to the table and then he was going to bring a private money lender for the other, I believe it was 650,000, wasn't it, Justin? Something like that. 650 K yeah. right in there. So he finds a private money lender. He brings us, but then he closed the deal and it was a Morby method, right? It's kind of a reverse Morby method, but what he does is he's in California. So he closes title there and then he opens up title on a refi. Right. And so what he told us was, you know, it was a bunch of kind of, well, we're getting to it and we're doing this. And, and it was all of these excuses and they made sense up to the point where we got into the refi. He gets to the refi and we start telling him, you know, we, we want our money back or, you know, we're going to have to start taking action, blah, blah, blah. So we end up getting some, because he transferred title, right? So he transfers title and then he, so he opens up with another escrow. We get the irrevocable escrow instructions in with that title company, but then he circumvented us and went to another title company, right? So he, he, <laughs> It, 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 he literally kept it where it was, right? Kind of let the deal sit there. He opens up escrow with the same title company, but just in a different county, because in California, title and escrow are separate. And so basically, long story short, he ends up keeping our $57,000, pays the private money lender, leverages the property out to the hilt. He gets a, uh, the, the, so he got, and the, uh, he got somebody to uh, basically come onto the loan with him. So uh, there's potential fraud in that. But then later on, come to find out, right, when you start running everything, this guy has 67 counts of fraud in Orange County for felony, um, you know, uh, robbing, the, robbing Orange County of like $5 million, right? So we found out all of that later on down the road. So it was very difficult because it, when I tell you this guy was brilliant, like folks, I'm, I'm not easily duped. He was, he was brilliant. This isn't my first time in a real estate deal. And I've, and I have gone back and told this guy as the process went on, like, it's funny that you don't just do it the right way in real estate, because you could make millions of dollars. You're, you're, you're absolutely brilliant when it comes to real estate, but you're choosing to do it this way. And so where I'm headed with that is he was very, very convincing. I mean, he, he brought a schedule of, of real estate. He brought, you know, everything that we asked for as we asked for it. And so the deal very much sounded like it was on the up and up until we went to it, until we were in the inner workings of it. So I guess, uh, you know, high insights 2020, but you know, it'd be nice to have you hear it and what maybe you would have done differently in that instance in terms of information and trying to vet him out. Because as soon as I heard 60 some odd counts of fraud, I would have head tail and ran the other way. Right. Totally. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's where I say you background and credit check your tenants. Why isn't this, mm -hmm. I mean, you would have immediately caught it, right? And so if we pretend that he had no history, because this is the thing about a lot of these private lender scammers, it's not even worth going to court. And if you go to court, it doesn't even mean you get paid back, right? You can win a judgment, it does not mean you get paid back. And like I was telling you guys, I won my arbitration or my mediation, but getting my money from those fools like, oh my gosh, getting them to actually do the fixes as if the two-year process of winning wasn't painful enough. Meanwhile, you've got attorney's bills the whole time. And of course, he ended up paying mine. But but now you got to get your money back, even if you get a judgment. So back to, you know, what I do differently, right? Obviously, the background and credit check is step one. Baseline, if you do nothing, if nobody hires me do that. Like <laughs> do that. So, but then here's the other thing about these smooth criminals, because I've got two smooth criminals too. The second you dig two layers deep, they 
get spicy. <laughs> and, and it's not fun. It like makes me sweat, makes my heart beat. Um, but it makes me a little angry. It makes me want to get spicy back too. But like, it's like, no, you, you dig two layers deep. Everything falls apart with these guys. And so, um, and I've had a couple of those now, um, very, very, um, <laughs> so in my report of inquiry, when, I, when I done, when I'm done doing my two week investigation, I do characterize the, um, compliance, <laughs> the cooperation of the, uh, parties. And so I had a very, very uncooperative, uh, couple of parties in some of my, uh, investigations. And so, like those people show their ass really quick. You just have to ask them a couple of extra questions, right? And um, it's really, really easy to get mad at me because I'm a third party. <laughs> so um, then I just get to report back to you like, oh, well, uh, everything checked out except for this one thing. And then when I came back and asked them questions, then all these other things fell apart. And then here's the other thing that I find too. So one, there's patterns of behavior. Um, so even if somebody doesn't have a record, um, or let's say they do have a record, that's not really a problem. It's the pattern of behavior that's a problem, right? And so same thing with when I ask questions, when people repeatedly do not answer my question, excellent. I have like specifically been trained to cue in on this and I get really um, kind of jazzed up about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that is like, part of it too and it, it's kind of an irritant in the process because these are people that are very used to getting away with not answering the question and not providing the information and oh yeah 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 no problem and then later we ask and then it actually is a problem hmm okay well when we talked um you said you provide me this information and so anyway um I would say it, it's hard to say because I don't know like how smooth he was and what the conversations were. But I can tell you with my own uh, defaulted screwballs, like it's so funny. Um, So every 27th is when I'm supposed to be paid and uh, the last four 27th I have not. Um, And not to mention we're in default of 80K that they haven't even, balloons are way past due. So, um, but every time I talk to them, it's next week, it's next week, it's next week, it's Mm. tomorrow. It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. And it, and they get so irritated when you call them on it because I am in contact with the six other lenders that they are also in default with. And they send me the sweetest cheery messages like next week. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. But he says that every week, guys. <laughs> so most people are used to being able to say, okay, good, good. They're taking care of me. They're communicating. This is good. And so you give people a pass because you're nice <laughs> but when when you cue in on it and when you call them out on it they get pretty spicy so they're obviously not very nice to me but they're very nice to the other guys but they're screwing all of us so I'm like does it really matter <laughs> <laughs> right mm-hmm. yeah sound familiar Damon <laughs> yeah 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 I mean it, it I thought she was talking about her their friends right. yeah exactly. they all sound the same they're all these distraction masters they're mm-hmm. these narcissists smoking mirrors, like smoking mirrors, yeah. oh they're amazing yeah i have this whole list of things mind you these people uh were also partners on a thing and that's what really cued me in on everything is like all the money was disappearing and none of the projects were going like, that's interesting and then cell phone bills were coming out of the accounts and so I've got this tally of everything that's owed and we communicate regularly, which means nothing if you're not getting paid, but um, they wanted to quibble about the cell phone bill. And I was like, that's what you want to talk about? You're not going to respond to anything else. You want to quibble about the cell phone? <laughs> yeah. It's a distraction from yeah. the other, the yeah, other money, that, the larger money that they owe you. Yeah. Yeah. So- we don't even have to talk about all the ugly. If you just do your due diligence, I created a whole service to help people avoid this because um, the part of the thing is too like there's risk mitigation tactics. There's ways you can you can transfer risk, you can mitigate risk. If we see, hey, mm-hmm. you're not you have no security as second position in this no equity sub two. So would you like to cross collateralize? Would you like a PG? Would you like 
uh, to be a partner from the beginning and on title and have a performance clause in place that you can come off title once they pay you, right? So think about risk mitigation in a way, and that's that's what I help with when I when I look at these deals. So, um, because we could get all spicy and talk about these losers all day, but um, it's like so. Well, much I'll tell you. Speaking of that, Melissa, I I, I love I love that because I've got one for you right now. That's the that's the reason why I was building up to this. I've I've actually got one that I'd like to loan on. So let's talk if you have a chance after this at some point. Sure. I've got a I got a deal uh, that I think probably it seems like a good deal, right? But I'd love I'd love for you to bet it. So cool. anyway, yeah. yeah. So I always say pass my pass on to the borrower too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's amazing. I well, and I mean, so not only have you brought together a business based on what you're good at and you're helping obviously everybody by vetting these folks, which I think is in in the current market is a phenomenal thing to do because these snakes are coming out of the grass more and more and more and they are getting better and better and better um at the smoke and mirrors as you say so i guess like if you guys would like to i'd like to maybe start to open up the room to questions because i'm sure people have a, a a ton of questions when it comes to you know vetting these deals and everything so Guys, if you want to raise your hands, if you have some questions for Melissa in here, um, don't be shy. Come on up um, and ask your questions. Um, and maybe, you know, you guys will see it from a perspective that we haven't already. So anybody in the room have any questions? No one. There'll be a ton all. of questions out there. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, I mean, honestly, unbelievable how people don't have questions. <laughs> There we go. There right, we Jack go. Johnson. I had a question. I was getting this concern that absolutely no one had a question. Mark's breaking the deal. So, Jack. Explain yourself well enough. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, so, oh, we'll, yeah, we'll let Jack. Jack. He's got his hand up. Oh, sorry. You come up. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, This is probably a dumb question. It's been answered before, but how in the hell do I find you to use your services ASAP? Yeah. So, I should have come better prepared with the, the my... best question right how do you get in touch with cardinalcreative.com yeah. um it's also capitalverified.com i'm working on rebanding but um so whatever you type in it'll be in there but um so there are two options for my services one is the due diligence and then the other is the investor passport. So it's essentially your third-party verified CV. Uh, Ralph Pombo's in here. He's actually one of my uh, verified investors. He's got an um, investor passport. That's a month-long process. That one is not something you do when you have a deal. When you have a deal, you want to do the due diligence so that it's quicker. Um, and then I'm actually looking at the deal, the person, and the information, not just the person, which is what the um, what the investor passport is. Okay, so follow-up question to that then. The investor passport, I know it's for me as far as how I get vetted, but do I recommend that the people that I'm doing deals with, do I tell them, okay, you need to go through this too before we can do deals or? Well, if you have a deal that's already in queue, it's kind of better. So here's here's what I'll say. Like I have the investor passport because people ask for it. People wanted to have like, hey, these are verified investors. They've got assets, um, criminal background checks, credit, whatever. That's done. But if you heard my like my methodology and what I preach is like deal, person, and information, right? And so the person relevant to the deal and the exit strategy. So if you're like, hey. I want you to um, have an investor passport before we work together. That's fine, but you need to understand that the deal's on you um, and that I still highly recommend you're assessing that person matching with the exit strategy at play. Now, if you have a deal in motion, it's better to go with the due diligence because you're going to get recommendations that are tailored to that deal. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. So is it kind of like a TSA pre-screen, kind of, basically? <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't even know what, what qualifies anybody for that. Like, 
you pay that that's a pay to play thing as far as i can tell <laughs> yeah so can you tell what is the cost for that uh for the screening for the, the passport uh, rather the passport's 2400 and that's a month long process mm -hmm. and then the due diligence is 1600 and that's two weeks and I will say, I just went to a private lenders conference and they had all of the um, data for like 40,000 transactions um, for a September to September timeframe. And in that time, the average cost of underwriting was 1200 and the average cost of loan processing was 2200. So most people are paying about $3,400 for processing loans. And I'm like, I'm below the national average. Like you're getting, <laughs> you're getting a steal of a deal according to forty thousand dollars or forty thousand data points. So, was, um, yeah. <laughs> was that the AAPL in Vegas? That conference? Yeah. Ah, Did you go? Okay. No, I'm, I was looking at it. and I was thinking about joining. So I'm glad you're in it. it was, so that it's kind of yeah. It was awesome. It was really okay. cool. Sweet. Thank you, Jack. Did that yep. answer it? Yep, awesome. yep, yep. I'm good to go. Appreciate it. All right. So, Jack, anybody else in the room have any questions? Guys, I mean, it's invaluable information. If you are doing any kind of loaning, and <laughs> I speak from experience, and you're not betting these folks the right way, uh, or uh, you don't know how to bring deals to get vetted the right way, uh, now is the time, right? Uh, the, the, the dumbest question is the one that you didn't ask. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I can I just make mention really quick? It, it's something that's really amazing. Paul, Lu so if you're in the room and you're looking at Zoom, Paul Luter and Heath Medley are right on top of one another and is an absolute ode to the United States military. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. One's Marine Corps and one's Army. <laughs> yeah. It's so I got I got to jump in there. So my I got two flags on my Navy on top Marine Corps. Hey. So I was okay. uh, gotcha. a Navy corpsman and then a Navy medical officer, but deployed twice with the Marine Corps. So that's why both are near and dear to me. Awesome. I love that, man. Wow. I love that. Impressive. It's, a, it's an absolute ode to the United States military. Thank you guys for what you do, man. I appreciate you both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyways, uh, that being said, so. I, I mean, Lance, always you kind of talk about mindset and mm -hmm. I would love to hear about her mindset when she's vetting these deals, because I do remember at one point and Justin will vouch for this because one of the things that people know about me in the community, I'm much like Abraham Gray. I'm a black belt in, in uh, jujitsu and I've done MMA and I fought while, well, you know. And, and when this whole thing was going on, I mean, like, I absolutely lost it. I was like, I'm going to come out to California and I'm going to find you. And then I'm going to make you disappear in the desert. Right. Like, <laughs> and Justin had to like, talk me down off the fence. Like, don't do it, man. Don't do it. <laughs> like, how do you keep a cool head while you're talking to these people? It frustrates me to no end. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the first, the first two uh, due diligence inquiries I did were so far the most volatile ones I had. And I was like, oh, fun, 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 fun. I remember this because I used to do criminal investigations for sexual assaults. And um, I'll tell you who's an indignant like asshole about stuff is a rapist. So um, unfortunately, I've had some really, I say, you know, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Like I've had experience with some pretty horrible people um and you catch more flies with honey and I'm like okay you know what what am I supposed to do about uh this person being wicked and honestly it's not easy like I didn't love doing um I was really good as it, as a cop but I hated that it was reactionary I hated that it was after something bad already happened um I hated the like emotional toll of it because you're dealing with victims and you're dealing with um, criminals. And so for me, this is fun because it's preventative. I'm helping you avoid that mm. asshole. And I'm like, let's go. Like, please oh, show me more of who you are so I can help them avoid you. <laughs> Proactive rather than reactive. 
right? That's right. Yes. Love that. Oh, uh, yeah, like Damon, the, Justin the, was yeah. trying to ask a question a minute ago. I was no, I was just say, I was just saying that Mark had a question, but it looks oh, like he got okay. in the chat, so it's all good. Yeah, I'm good now. Thank you. All right. You're still welcome to ask the question, Mark. Sorry if I cut you off. No, it, it's good. I, I was just going to ask. It, it sounded like more of what Mel is working on is is from the lender's perspective. So I was curious why more borrowers are not reaching out to say like, help me become a good borrower and prove that. But yeah. um, that was before she talked about the passport service or which, which I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of. So I thought maybe that was just the nature of the beast. And if you're a good borrower, you have good lenders that you already have lined up, but um, that kind of explained the, the dynamic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops. I got a sassy boxer. One moment. Well, yeah, what I love about that too, though, Mark, that, that you bring that up, it, she's kind of like a double-edged sword, right? That not only is she vetting the, you know, the, the potential borrower, she's also, you know, vetting of these folks that are going to lend, right? So it seems as though she could duly not only vet these folks, but bridge the gap for those that need lenders, right? So. Yeah. You know, hey, I need a lender. Um, you know, you can go to Mel, and she's got vetted. Do you mind if I call you Mel? By the way, I, I don't yeah, know Mel. I, I go by both. Yep, and I've got Mel right. on all of my social media because it's shorter, less characters. And Melissa mm -hmm. Palmer was taken. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't just want to like not ask you and and make an yeah, assumption you're... there. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, like it, well, I was telling them it's interesting, right? Because you bridged the gap because. You know, a borrower slash a lender, you're not only vetting the borrowers, you're vetting the lenders as well. And you're able to marry those folks. So, hey, I need a lender. I need a, you know, a good lender who can get this deal done. Mm -hmm. We can also come to you and you can bridge that gap for us as well. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so I even treat the due diligence process as a consultative process for both parties, because I'm like, uh, unless somebody's being really wicked with me, like I'm here for everybody to make money, right? Like that's the whole purpose is just to do it safely. So, um, I, and I'll give an example. I had, uh, this one, um, borrower who had, was borrowing a significant, I think it was like $450,000 for a luxury fix and flip. And, um, it was kind of gap funding because hard money lender had run out and it was almost done. And without getting into too many details that don't matter, the point is, um, this person had experience with fix and flips, um, and they were a new um, realtor, but they did not have any experience with luxury fix and flips and they were planning on selling the property. And so when I spoke with her, I was like, look, um, you know, everything's checking out. And because I treat this like a consultative process, I would just like to ask you some questions, um, partly because I'm obviously reporting this back to the lender, but also because this can help you generate some ideas and like think about your plan moving forward. And so when I was talking to her, I was like, okay, no experience with luxury fix and flips. Like what are the main brokers in your area that are selling fix or uh, luxury, luxury properties? And she's like, I don't know. I said, okay, you better do your research and find at least three of them. And I was like, okay, and who's the top agents that are selling these properties? And what's, you know, what are the specific comps in your neighborhood right now? Not when you started. Because of course, everybody does that research in the beginning, but now you're getting close to this being done uh, and you're approaching at that time, approaching the holidays, holiday or winter season or whatever, they were getting close um, to like fall timeframe. So I was like, you want to make sure this thing's sold before fall, because once you get the winter, you're screwed because that's the slow season. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just walking through all of this and even recommending, like, if you don't sell it in a month, you should already have people lined up to partner with because there's plenty of um, co-listings that you can do with other luxury agents. And so anyway, like all to say, like I, I would like to treat this as a consultative process for both parties because obviously I don't want the borrower to get screwed either just because, you know, you're getting into sometimes some pretty uh, sharky deals because those are the opportunities you have. And everybody can make money if we do it right, but you're going to eat it <laughs> if you don't make money, especially, you know, if this person properly securing themselves. Um, um, and I absolutely love that because, it, you know, like I'm, I'm, I like probably everybody else in Pace's community. I'm really big on bringing value, right? It's, it's, and I think Lance and just all of us in here are very much that way. And it's, 
you know, I think you're, you're finding ways to bring value at multiple levels, right? And it makes you invaluable. I mean, that's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Hey, we have uh, a couple hey, of questions finally. Yeah, I was just getting, you have yeah, okay. Patricia. Yes, Patricia. Oh, oh. Hey. Okay. hey guys, hi. How hey. are you? Hi. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Mel, for, for coming to this to this um, uh, meeting and, and for, for all this information. I think it's absolutely very um, necessary in our community. Patricia, um, turn, can you turn yeah? on your camera? Can you turn on your camera? Oh, snap. I'm just, uh, I, I was driving, sorry. That's okay. That's all right. That's a, oh, man. There, there she is. Can you see me? Oh, there you go. There she is. <laughs> the background. It's, a, so, it's yeah, beautiful it's, there um, in San Francisco. <laughs> sorry. This, <laughs> so, so yeah, but thank you so much for coming over and talking about this. And um, yeah, I think it's absolutely necessary and, and we will definitely use your services. Um, and in your experience, where are you finding these borrowers that are more um, open to sharing? Uh, just a minute, guys. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. I don't want to like fill oh. in the blank, but all right, that's all right. <laughs> I can answer hey, a question. I'll tell you what, why does it why didn't Brandon come in and ask his question and then we'll come back to Patricia? How about that? Sure. Sorry, guys. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, okay. Well, that was a so I'm actually at one of my rental properties that I'm fixing up. <laughs> and uh there was a situation. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so so where where are you seeing that you're finding these borrowers that are willing to do, um, you know, to to be open and and to share the kind of information that that we need, uh, in order for us to be able to properly vet them, you know, like because we do come across, I do come across a lot of uh, borrowers. Um, or people who are connecting, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information. How do you? How do you uh, how do you overcome that? Because a lot of times you may be looking at good deals, but then the borrower doesn't want to provide the information. Um, not and I know you're going to say, well, if they don't want to provide the information, then maybe it's not a good deal. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Go find your money elsewhere. I don't know. Like, because right. because here's the thing: if you don't have any information to actually say it's a good deal, you're investing in the returns. And you're also investing in nothing because are you going to see those returns? You have, you have absolutely no reason to believe that you're going to see those returns other than that they said it. So it's all, <laughs> it's all about risk mitigation. If they're not willing to give you that information, then you're at a much higher risk of, of, mm -hmm. of issue. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It absolutely happens all the time. Whatever. We have a job form that we use that basically is an analyzer. We send the job form. If they can't answer and fill out the questionnaire, we're not babysitting. We're not in the babysitting business, you know? So that's it. <laughs> if they don't want to do that little spend, what, 20, 30 minutes to fill out a questionnaire and, and post some, uh, you know, put some links in there, contract agreements, you know, photos, comps, like, sorry, you you must not really want that money, you know? So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Was that it, Patricia? I, I always say for any... For any property that I have ever purchased, I have never minded giving the lender whatever they needed. Mm -hmm. You're asking ever. somebody for yeah. money. You should provide information. <laughs> we get a minimum. For sure. Thank for you, sure. Patricia. Also, Patricia is one Patricia. of my favorite uh, partners, by the way. We're partners on a deal, guys, on the mobile home park. Big She's deal. Amazing. Not just a deal. <laughs> That's awesome. So, okay. Brandon, you want to hop on here, man? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for putting this together. Much appreciated. Melissa, thank you for you know, um, educating us all. Very appreciated. Um, as a part of your, um, when you're vetting a borrower, do you dig into the, the GCs or any of the contractors that they're putting forth and get into that information and, and uh, validate them as well? So I don't, but I could um, because I'm able to pull professional licenses and I can also pull those background um, checks. So like 
that could be an add-on because those are just additional reports that I have to pull. But I, it's certainly important what I do if they're doing a fix and flip is I make sure um, that they're at least providing me the licenses, they're providing me the names, um, they're providing me their work history with them. Um, and this is where people go quiet because they're doing a fix and flip, but they don't actually have a contractor yet. Yeah. Um, usually, right? They're just like yeah. locking those up and they're going to figure it out. And I'm going to build this plane as I'm flying it. And so um, that's not to say you can't do those deals, but that's something that I highlight in my report for gaps and risks and some things to consider. Um, and so in answer to your question, I could, I oh. certainly could. Cool. Yeah, that was something I was just curious about as you get some of the, the newer fix and flippers or people that are not so experienced. And I've seen in California, a lot of um, dubious contractors starting up shop and folding shop and then starting everywhere. Up. Yeah. So, <laughs> contractors. And, and that's what I tell people too. Like if you've been in real estate for two seconds, you either have been mm -hmm. ripped off or know someone who's been ripped off. And often it's by the contractors, right? But then when you're in our space and we're actually partnering with people, it doesn't take long to hear about people getting ripped off by their partners either. So yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And the other question I had is uh, you're developing a, a nice portfolio of, of vetted borrowers. Do you play connector to some of the skaters? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, Ralph can speak to like, every time I see somebody who's like, or, um, when I see somebody posted like, oh, um, who's doing co-living and like one of my uh, vetted borrowers is a co-living badass. So, like I've already reviewed his record. So I'm like, Jimmy does it, you know, and <laughs> like Ralph's a, you know, somebody else is looking for, for something. And it's, if I see it right, but I am building a mailing list and my goal is to spotlight my, um, my, it, it's not, you know, done yet. And I'm not great at the whole email thing. And I wish I didn't have to be the marketer, the salesperson, the doer and the builder, but um, <laughs> the intent would be to spotlight some of my um, investors as well that are already verified. Awesome. Awesome. I'll go ahead and, and if I see it, I'll connect you guys too. Um, Please. Thank kidding. you. Much yeah. appreciated. So, well, Melissa, you've got to look into MailChimp or Clavio. Yep. I yep. have. Flow desk and I love it, but then I have to do yeah. it. It's copy. It's it's so much crap. It's like setting up the flows is the hardest. I mean, it's yeah. like, it takes. But once it's done, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm in the, I'm in the midst of all of that right now. I'm a software engineer, so like that's what I do is set up uh, like all of the. Like uh, the I love to outsource. Let's let's <laughs> talk some tradesies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get rid of the stuff that i don't like and focus on the, my zone of genius um hey, hey yeah. Mel, i've got a question i've got a question for you yeah um so you so you've started this this consultancy and you've obviously done really well with it um i think there's a, a great spotlight on you and and great spotlight on the need to vet deals in general what do you aspire to with this where do you want to take it like are you wanting to just keep it sort of insular with you are you planning on doing a training course are you planning on bringing more people on to help you what's what's the story there yeah so i am building a course right now um and i am so i've got a certified fraud um examiner that's also on my team with me i've got two pis that i outsource work to i would love 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 to build the team bigger than that right now i can't um mm -hmm. i love that you say that it's obvious i'm doing well i appreciate that i always tell people um, attention and noise does not always equal dollars Can't course, take yeah. to the bank. <laughs> so, um, so I do have clients, right. And it is doing well and there is traction. And so I am very grateful for that. Um, I will say, uh, there's, I'm, I'm paying other people <laughs> and I'm paying for a system, but I don't pay myself. So anyway, I would like it to be a real business that I can actually, you know, I can call it a business, not a, a unpaid job, but, um, aspiring. Um, I do, I am building the course and I'm doing that because I spend so much time doing this um, that I feel like I might as well be recording this and helping people. And I've got all, a whole bunch of templates and, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, graduate student. I was a behavioral research scientist for two years after I um, got out of the military. And so I'm a forever student. And so I kind of geek out on that crap anyway. And so I'm like, okay, let me do that. And then that way I can have that where it's it's my clone doing the work for me because right. 
I'm doing so many talks that I'm like, I want to help people, but I want to make it make sense for my business too. So do that. And I can focus on building the due diligence service out a little more. And honestly, the data I think is so critical. Um, and so I would love, love, love to have a much more robust database to be able to um, be like, you know, the guys that were at the private lenders conference that were able to talk about the 40,000 40, transactions that they had in their database and they could speak to them. I can, you know, hopefully if we're talking crazy here, um, I can talk about 40,000 transactions that I have oversight of and I can tell you what private lending and um, default lenders and all of that data looks like because that's a big black hole of information because if it doesn't go public, you don't have, nobody knows that these guys are these serial criminals that don't right. meet the threshold of criminal because nobody's, they already lost money. So they're not taking them to court. They're not making right. these records public. So right. uh, mm -hmm. that's my goal. I would love to be that database essentially um, so that people can protect themselves. Um, right now, I think the baseline is just doing those actual background checks, right? But the mm -hmm. next level is like, what's the stuff that doesn't meet that threshold that doesn't make it to that? database and i'd like to be that yeah gotcha i think that yeah, we should definitely good. talk about how i could help you maybe derive that that like uh privy to that data i could probably help with something like that i could architect something like that anyway well nice guys i always say um in 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 uh like in uh, appreciating Melissa's time, um, it's now 7.05. I don't want to keep her on here forever. She's busy. She has things to do. Um, we appreciate you so much, Melissa, for coming on. Um, I always say time is the most precious thing that we have. And when you're willing to give it up to us, um, me, Lance, all of these guys, we're so appreciative of that. Um, so thank you for your time. We appreciate you educating us. Yes. Um, once again, can you put out to everybody how they get in touch with you? Just, you know, if you want to blast it out there, Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, website, whatever, telephone number, whatever you've got. Um, Melissa is going to put it out in the chat, guys. Yeah. Um, and as always, guys, uh, I have always appreciated those along my real estate journey, my life that has been a journey, um, those that were willing to invest time. Um, and help me to learn something. I hope that everybody has learned something. Yes. Because this is huge, guys. When you're out there and you are doing any kind of private money lending or borrowing, mm. you need to know what the lenders expect and you need to be vetted and they need to be vetted the right way. Um, I have definitely failed forward on this, so I can speak to it, right? And uh, I know Lance has as well. I know Justin has as well. Um, so guys, when I tell you it's vitally important, it is vitally important. She's doing a massive service. So, yes. I wanted to just throw out our YouTube. Justin, can you throw the YouTube channel in the chat, man? Uh, Follow us, go subscribe, like our YouTube channel, guys, the creative collective outside the box. Right. And if you're not following us on Facebook, get in there. We're doing these every yeah, week. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, man. I always, I, I always fail on that without fail every week. Right. So yeah. 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 Thank yeah, guys, you. Please, man. Like us on all those platforms. Thanks Mel. Everybody. You're amazing. Appreciate Thanks Damon. We'll, we'll see you on the next show. See Bye. you next week guys. Thank you guys.